All right, so in the past decades, we've seen an increase in the so-called populist supply uh, across the world, right? That is the sheer number of populist parties, leaders, movements, etc. They've taken up until today, probably a rather unprecedented uh, proportion. Um, this not only in the more studied European and Latin American countries, but even going beyond these like Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines even, etc. Um, with that in mind, it has never been more important to have an actual, accurate and comprehensive understanding of which actors can and should be actually considered populist. Um, the identification and the measurement of uh, populist supply is vital for that uh, to occur. As of recent, uh, several research efforts have been set out to do exactly that. And in that regard, I'm having a conversation today with Matthias Brodan, together with various other colleagues and relying on their combined expert judgment, uh, he has created a data set called The Populist um, that provides an overview and a classification of uh, populist, far left, far right, and Eurosceptic parties. So Matthias, uh, let us start with uh, the more general notions of uh, the populist. Can you tell us something more about kind of the general setup uh, of the data set what were the main goals? Why you have uh, created the data set? Yeah, so I think it, it, it started a couple of years ago when um, uh, a journalist approached me, uh, a Bloomberg uh, journalist, and he asked me if I had an overview of populist parties in Europe. And um, I told him there are some, there is some work uh, that you can use, but it's already pretty old. It's, uh, uh, it's not up to date anymore. It's uh, Cas Mutter's work, for instance, uh, about populist radical right parties. Uh, Stein van Kessel's book, uh, he also uh, provides a list of populist parties. But it was not up to date anymore. And um, it was also uh, uh, not complete. So I thought, OK, um, I, 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 can, I can help you with it. Let's uh, make a list together. Um, that's what we did. And later on, the uh, uh, Guardian approached me, and they had an, uh, a very large project about populism. And uh, they, they asked me if I could help them again and if they could use my um, uh, the list I had constructed. Um, and of course, and the list was not complete. It was not very good yet. Um, and they told me, uh, we, we can help you. Let's just, uh, uh, you come up with a list, right? So uh, what you think is a, is, a, is, an, is a good overview of populist parties in the last two decades, uh, 1998, 2018. Um, and um, I made that list, but I also told them, you know, I, I know a lot about populism in the Netherlands, maybe France, Germany, the UK, but there are many countries in uh, Central and Eastern Europe that I, that my knowledge uh, is not really uh, good enough, right? So um, what we did is we, together with uh, journalists at The Guardian, we approached several country experts, and we asked them to help us classify parties as either populist, far right, far left, and Eurosceptic. Um, and that resulted in, uh, in, in an overview of, of, of all these parties. And that was um, uh, for, for this, this Guardian project on populism that wanted to assess um, uh, exactly what you, what you uh, started the conversation with, uh, the idea that populism has increased over the years. They wanted to show that. So they wanted to show that an increasing a uh, number of people is voting for populist parties. Um, and, that, and this list was basically the, the, the main source for that story. Um, after we, we finished uh, this collaboration, which I really liked because it was nice to work with journalists, it was nice that this, this article was out there and that it was really like a, in, in a big uh, newspaper. Um, but I also thought, okay, now we have this list, let's do more with it. I mean, it can be very useful for both academics and journalists. Mm -hmm. um, let's expand the list. Let's make it even better. Let's do more. Um, and that's when I uh, thought, well, maybe we should uh, we should uh, uh, design a list, and 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 that is going to be a, a data set in itself. Um, and that became the populist. Um, and of course, this time I didn't do it. Uh, I, I did much less by myself. I um, asked other people to, to join me because um, uh, I, I am an expert on populism and the radical right. Um, but I, there is a lot of stuff I don't know, lots of countries I'm not uh, an expert on. So I wanted to have more people in, in, in the team uh, so that we could like cover a wider field. 
Um, that's what we did. And, uh, but that's of course still not enough because uh, uh, we also need real country expertise. So we approached, I think uh, in total around 80 experts uh, in Europe and we asked them to help us classify these parties. And that uh, resulted in the, in, 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 in the populist. And um, the populist became the populist 2.0, uh, the next uh, version of it. And there we go further back in time from 1998 to uh, 1989. Um, we uh, included more parties. So in the first list, we uh, only included uh, parties with uh, at least 2% of the votes in the new list, we also included all parties uh, that have seats in parliament. Mm -hmm. um, what else did we do? We, uh, we linked it to other data sets, so, which means that uh, it's much more easy to uh, uh, combine data sets. Um, and we also uh, provided more information about borderline cases, because you can imagine um, many experts uh, experts, there, there, there is some agreement, of course, on which parties are really populist, uh, textbook examples, but there are many parties on which uh, experts uh, disagree, and therefore they are borderline cases. And now we provide more information on them. And basically this resulted in the, the website and the, 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 the list we have right now. So to a large extent, the the setup of the data set is in line with what you could call expert surveys, right? You also refer to the experts uh, yourself, yet from our previous conversations, it's, it's still, it remains somewhat different from your typical expert survey, like the Chapel Hill uh, expert survey, etc. So maybe can you describe why the populist can be maybe seen as a a typical uh, expert survey and maybe tell us something more about how it differs from your average uh, expert survey. Yeah, so an expert survey usually or one of the important things expert surveys often do is they ask or they, they, they want to position parties in terms of their issue positions, their ideology uh, on a scale uh, often. Um, and um, and how, how do they do it? They ask experts in the country and then compute the average position right that the, uh, um, taken from these uh, all the scores experts provide um, and i think this is a very good and valid approach um, the important difference uh, with what we do is that uh, we do not position parties on a scale uh, we only categorize them so we categorize them as either populist or not far right or not, far left or not, you're a skeptic or not. Um, this is a different approach. So this is not a matter of degree, but it, it is a either or, right? It's more, uh, it's a party family approach instead of a, a, a positioning approach. And um, we thought uh, we need experts for their knowledge, but in the end, um, it has to be, uh, uh, it, it's only a classification task we do. And we want it to be truly comparative across Europe. Um, and in the end, our team consists of uh, uh, comparative researchers, all experts in uh, at least one of the uh, fields I just mentioned. So at least uh, in, in, in two of them, populism and far right or far left and Euroscepticism. Um, so we can cover quite a lot. We know a lot about these parties. Um, so we can, uh, we ask experts whether they think according to the definitions we, 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 we employ, if parties are uh, could be categorized uh, in one of those boxes I just mentioned, and then based on their arguments, we ourselves decide in the end whether the parties actually should be classified as such. So we, in the end, make the final decision. We do not compute an average score or whatever, but mm -hmm. we inform ourselves. But in the end, we make the decisions, and I think that's the main difference with an expert survey. And I think um, uh, this is a valid approach when you uh, focus on specific party families instead of uh, issues and instead of positioning. Um, and when the team, um, uh, your team consists of experts themselves as well. So usually when you have an expert survey, 
um, you really need the expertise of uh, um, um, the country experts because, and they're going to classify all the parties, not, not classify, but position all these parties. And this is not what, what we do in our, uh, um, in our approach. So you might, no, it's not an expert survey, but to some extent it's, it's a more uh, qualitative version uh, uh, of, of, of what expert surveys do, basically. But there are, there are more differences than just that. So what, what are some of the advantages of doing what we can maybe call an expertise survey or this kind of assessment of doing it in-house rather than, let's say, branching out to local uh, experts? Yeah. Um, I, think, um, I think the most important um, uh, advantage is that we that we have the overview based on the information we get. So for instance, a problem I think with expert service is that you, for instance, if uh, um, uh, people uh, that, that make an expert survey approach me as an expert and they ask me to position the parties in the Netherlands uh, right on, on a certain issue. Um, the problem is that I will then position the parties, but I cannot really compare what the other experts do how the other experts position parties in their countries. And um, what we do is uh, we really compare what, what, what experts in country A say to what experts in country B say, say. And it's very well possible that the expert in country A says, uh, these are my arguments and therefore I classify this party not as populist. Whether, uh, and that the experts in another country make a, make, make a right uh, about a party that is very, very similar to this party, make another argument and they classify it as not populist, for instance. And we can see that. We can see that they make similar arguments, that the parties are similar, and, and, and we can in the end decide, okay, this, this is how we think that we should classify this party. And then, of course, we, we, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I already mentioned it, but we have this uh, we also classify parties that are borderline cases and we classify them as borderline. If experts disagree, mm -hmm. we, 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 we make that clear. And of course, you also have that in, in real expert service because there you can look at the standard deviation of however you or however you do it. Um, but we, uh, um, I think the fact that we keep control, that we really compare the cases with each other, that's one of the main advantages of what we do. For, for me personally, I think one of the great advantages of the data set is that you actually integrate other data sets or other variables with it so that it becomes a more, a broader data set even. Yeah. What are some of the, the additional variables or the data sets that you are integrating with uh, the, the populism variables or the classification? Yeah, that, that's, that's increasing. That's a good point. And um, I think we will, um, this will be something that, 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 that all studies in the end will, will have because there are many scholars who uh, really think that it's important that all these data sets can be connected to each other. But, but one example is- actually do it. So that's a but actually, yeah. advantage of your data set. Yeah, that's true. But, but for instance, the, the uh, Parlgov is, is, uh, is, is, they have a team and they, um, they uh, collect all kinds of information about parties, for instance, um, how they did during elections, whether they are in government in a certain time uh, period, um, what they also include uh, positions of parties, by the way. And there are, there are uh, other data sets like party facts that already like combine all kinds of uh, uh, data sets. And uh, we provide, so for every party that we include in the populace, we provide the party ID of the other uh, data sets, which means that you can easily combine what the, the, the information that we provide with the information that they provide. And you can, you, we, for instance, from our data set, you know if party X is far right. And from the other data set, you know that this party uh, is in government in uh, uh, between this and, 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 and that year, for instance. And you can combine the, 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 these two uh, pieces of information. And that is really, really helpful. There's, by the way, one, one other thing I wanted to, to add, what is a very big advantage of what we do. Uh, compared to uh, uh, real, uh, so to say, uh, expert surveys. And that is that um, we can also go back in time much more easily uh, because, of course, we can say about, we can look at parties in the past. We can we, we go back to 1989, for instance, but we can go back further if we want. 
Um, and that's much more difficult when it comes to uh, expert service because you have to ask experts and they really have to have knowledge of uh, you have you need more people right you need more experts to have a proper expert survey uh, and they need to have knowledge about the political situation uh, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and that's often very difficult if you want to go back further okay so then perhaps to the last part of uh, of this talk maybe we can in a more practical way have a look at uh, at the data set an example or walk us through you also have the, your own website for the data set can you basically show us what uh, what it looks like yeah so let me uh wait one second uh, i have to share my screen there we are can you see it now yeah all good yeah so this is the, the website and um, yeah, it provides an overview. This is the homepage. I will um, uh, hear us about here. You can read more about uh, the background information, the differences between this version and the previous versions um, and also the, the definitions we, we employ, right? So what is a populist party? What is a Eurosceptic party? Um, applications. So here we um, uh, show uh, media that have used the populist um, uh, data sets, uh, archives that use it, but also academic work that is uh, that, that uses the, the populace. They often um, use it in, in uh, there are many studies that focus on voting behavior, for instance, and they want to assess um, what explains, for instance, voting for populist parties, and they can use our uh, um, our data set to uh, classify parties as either populist or not, or far right or not far left or not. Um, so there it's, uh, it's really useful. And maybe here you can see, um, I really like uh, this graph. Let me see if I can uh, zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's a bit too much. <laughs> uh, here. So what you see here is um, we have, so we have four classifications, right? So we have populist, far right, far left, and you're a skeptic. What you see here is how often the combinations of these categories uh, happen in the real world. So you can see, see here that there are 54 parties um, that combine uh, a far right ideology with being populist and you're a skeptic. So that's a combination of um, uh, classifications that, uh, that is out there pretty often. So that, that's a popular combination, so to say. And this one also 35 cases uh, of parties that are far left and you're a skeptic. 24 cases of parties that are only populist. So not all the, not the other categories. And so this provides an overview of how the different categories are combined with each other. Can, and I think that's really- Maybe for a brief contextualization, mention how many countries you're more or less covering in the data set. Yeah, so that's um, over here. Um, go back here. Up, up, up. So it's, um, I think uh, it's 31 countries, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, so th that's the, 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 the scope of countries, and it goes back uh, to 1989. Okay, thank you. So basically, three decades, and, yeah. uh, uh, and basically, Europe. So we also include uh, EU countries. Not all, the, uh, not all the countries, by the way, but most of them. Um, what we show here, by the way, is, uh, well, the increase of populism over the years. So what you, you see on the vertical axis here is the vote share for populist parties uh, and for far left parties and for far right parties. And you can see here the colors represent all these different categories. And you can see that for all the categories in general, there is, well, it's increasing. Um, and in particular, the category that is increasing the most is the far right populist parties or the radical right wing populist parties. Uh, you can see that it's about 5% in 1992 and it's about 15% right now. So that's a pretty steep increase, I would say. And here you can see many different um, graphs we've built based on the data set. But let me go back because this is the application. Let me go back to the data set itself because I think that's really useful. Um, here you can see this is the first uh, graph we show. Uh, um, I think it's 
almost the same as the one I just uh, presented. Um, but here on the, the front page of the website, you can select uh, the PDF version of the list. And I've already opened it. This is what you see. Um, and basically you see for every uh, country, we list the parties, the parties that are classified as either populist, far right, far, far left, or Eurosceptic, or a combination, of course. Um, here you see all the parties, the, the original names, the English names over here, the abbreviations over here. And here you can see whether they are, uh, could be classified uh, in this category. So for instance, the FPÖ here, the uh, Freedom Party in Austria is populist, it's far right, it's not far left, and it's Eurosceptic, and it has seats right now, which means that it's in parliament right now, the dashed line here uh, in every country uh, separates the more, the older cases from the cases that are now mm -hmm. in parliament. Um, and we do that for every country and for uh, yeah for the last uh, uh, basically 30 years. Um, so this is the PDF version. It provides a, a quick overview. We also have the more detailed data set. You can find it here, the data in Excel sheet form. I've also opened this one already. Can you see it now? No, right? Uh, no. No. Wait, I have to do a new share. There you go. I think now you can. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what you see here is um, it's basically the whole data set. And let me very briefly tell you, it looks very complicated, but it's not. I will uh, just uh, walk through it. Here you see again the, the original name of the party. Here you see the country, Austria, Belgium. It's ordered by uh, country. Here you see the English name the abbreviation again. And here you see whether the party is populist or not. A one is populist, a zero means it's not populist. Here you see the same for the far right. Here for the far left and here for your skepticism. And then the final three columns, mm -hmm. these are the party ideas in all the other data sets to which you can link the data. So. By means of these numbers, you can link our information to the information from Party Facts, Parlgov, or the manifesto, the comparative manifesto data, which is um, a group of researchers analyzing uh, election manifestos um, and, and uh, also positioning parties based on these um, uh, these analyses of election manifestos. Um, there is more information. Um, so you can imagine that parties sometimes are populist and sometimes not, that they become uh, that they stop being populist or that they start being populist. So for every party, we also provide a start date and an end date. Um, for most parties, it's 1900 until uh, 2000, 2100, which means that it's populist for all those years or all the years in between, which means right? we only focus on 1989 until now, but we just took this, this whole uh, uh, frame. Um, so for instance, here, the FPÖ is populist all of the time in our uh, investigation. However, if we go, for instance, to this case in Greece, you see here that it starts being populist in 2008 and it stops in 2013. So here is, a, in, in most of the, the uh, cases, there is no, um, uh, time, a relevant time uh, change over time, but in some cases there is, and that is provided here. One thing I wanted to add, so here is also another column, it's populist underscore BL, which means borderline. Here it's indicated if a party is a borderline case, and here you see a one. This party, for instance, is a borderline case when it comes to populism. Um, and researchers can take that into account. You can uh, include, for instance, in your analysis, all the borderline cases, but you can also leave them out, say, uh, because you think, okay, if it's a borderline case and not, not, not all experts agree on, on, on this party being populist or you're a skeptic or far right, it's better to leave it out just to be sure. Um, so as a researcher or a, a, a student or a journalist, you can decide to drop 
parties that are borderline cases. Um, and these borderline uh, cases, uh, uh, this is for uh, populism, but we also have it for uh, the far right, for the far left, for your skepticism, etc. So this is basically, I think, very briefly uh, uh, how you can use the populist. So this one, I would say that Excel uh, data uh, is useful if you really want to uh, do a quantitative study. If you want to uh, link the populace to other data sets, it's necessary to use this, uh, this information. However, if you just want to know if a certain party is populist according to the populist or not, or far right, or you're skeptic, then it's more useful to just use this simpler PDF version of the list, because there you can see uh, uh, immediately if a party is classified as populist or not. But That's yeah. great. Thank you so much, Matthias. And the great news, of course, is that all the data is freely available uh, on your website, which is obviously something that we like very much. So thank yeah. you very much for not only can make... I, Go ahead. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Uh, what, what, I think is, um, uh, what I think is really useful is uh, to combine this with expert surveys. So what I want to... Uh, in the next version of the Populist, I'm going to um, also include a fact sheet with more... Uh, detailed information about the parties in every country, also based on uh, the, the, the expert survey uh, by uh, Maurits Meyers and Andrei Zaslov. Um, and there you can also see how populist or how left-wing or how, how nativist the party is. Um, and I think it's really interesting to combine that information and to, to, to get a deeper knowledge of these parties, in particular when your goal is to, to focus on specific parties or uh, a, a specific country or a comparative case study of uh, three or four countries, then I think this more detailed information can be very useful. And in, and in particular, combining uh, the list we have with uh, an, a, a, a real expert survey, so to say. All right. That Thank you very <laughs> much for this kind of brief insights into your data set and for uh, the conversation we just had. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you.